I think we're having some technical difficulties here. Um, some people can't join the webinar, it looks like. I'm getting all kinds of messages and texts. So I'm not sure exactly what happened. I apologize, but uh, I am recording this and I will forward this link along as soon as it's done uh, recording, okay? Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get this webinar started for the people that are here. My name is Dr. Ramel Geronimo. I am a chiropractic neurologist from San Diego. Um, I plan on doing these webinars at least once a month, and I will have the recordings posted here on my website. It's at shop.sdbraincenter.com. And if you have any emails uh, or questions, please uh, forward them to info at sdbraincenter.com. Okay, so I specialize in functional neurology and functional medicine, okay? The majority of my patients have some type of autoimmune disease or some type of chronic inflammatory disease that they're suffering from, okay? Uh, the majority of them have some type of brain fog or some type of uh, fatigue, uh, but that usually all comes back down to the gut. And today, that's why we are talking about IBS, because IBS is one of the more common gut issues around. So we're going to talk about the symptoms. We're going to talk about how to diagnose it. We're going to talk about how to kind of treat this on your own. And hopefully you guys will be able to manage this and minimize inflammation and get back to being healthy and get back to an active lifestyle, okay? Because that's what this is all about. I, I love, I think I have a great life. I'm blessed. I've got good energy and I've got the energy to spend time with my kids. I love to hike. I like to be outdoors. I like to explore. I like to travel. And really you can't do any of that if you don't have your health. And so that's my passion. My passion is helping people to regain their health. And hopefully these series of seminars that I'm going to do on a monthly basis will help you guys do that, okay? So let's talk about IBS. And again, the reason why I wanna talk about IBS is because so much of what is going on with the gut is having an influence in what's going on with the brain, okay? So when the gut's inflamed, it's gonna cause inflammation in the brain as well. And the big thing that you have to remember is that when you have inflammation in your brain, you're actually, actually accelerating the degeneration of those brain cells, meaning that you're accelerating the death of those brain cells. And those brain, brain cells are what's called post-mitotic, meaning they, they don't divide, they don't replicate, those brain cells are what you have. Once they're gone, they're gone forever, okay? So you definitely want to minimize brain inflammation. But what can also happen is the gut can also have an influence on neurotransmitters that's also in the, uh, in the brain. And these are the chemicals that basically determines our personalities, determines our moods, determines our energy levels, determines our mental clarity, okay? These are things like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, um, oxytocin, norepinephrine, all of these neurochemicals that you have uh, are basically kind of, you know, giving us our day-to-day -day, uh, energies and our needs, okay? And without those, we'd be very fatigued, we'd have a lot of brain fog, and we'd have eventually some type of disease. So that's why we're talking about the gut today, and that's why we're focusing on IBS. So, what is IBS? Well, IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, okay? And studies have shown that possibly, um, well, the most common symptoms of IBS are going to be bloating, distension, gas, and maybe sometimes you can get some uh, abdominal cramping or abdominal pain, okay? Now, you can also get constipation or diarrhea with this, but uh, those are typically your IBS symptoms, okay? Um, typically, when you start to have chronic diarrhea, 
this is when it starts to affect your lifestyle. This is when it starts to affect your day-to-day -day activities. You kind of have to plan trips around bathrooms. You know, you may have to plan, uh, just kind of map out your, your daily activities around bathroom breaks, okay? Because it's just something that you just have no kind of control over. Um, so this is really when it becomes an irritable bowel issue. Uh, this is really when it becomes a nuisance, and this is something that really can affect your quality of life, okay? So irritable bowel syndrome is very difficult to diagnose, uh, first of all. Um, it's kind of what doctors call a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that you rule out all the red flags first, you, you know, rule out cancer, you rule out irritable bowel syndrome, uh, you rule out all sort of colitis, you rule out um, uh, Crohn's disease or celiac disease or maybe internal gastric bleeds or gallbladder issues or appendicitis. Um, once you've ruled all that out and they basically can't find anything wrong with you, then the underlying diagnosis is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, so typically there aren't any blood tests to determine that you have IBS, but what I like to do when patients come in with, you know, gastrointestinal issues is that I like to do a food allergy testing, okay? Um, this is basically where we can find out um, what foods they're sensitive to and what foods are causing inflammation in their bodies. Okay, so that's one of the first tests I like to do. Um, and then I also like to do a stool test. Okay, now the stool test will kind of let me know if there's any type of dysbiosis or bacterial infections or maybe bacterial overgrowth. Uh, it will let me know if there's any type of fungal, candida, or yeast infections that could be occurring. Uh, it can also identify any types of malabsorption uh, and it can also identify any types of parasitic infections, okay? So those are the tests that you can run. There aren't, again, any tests that's gonna tell you that you have irritable bowel syndrome, but you kind of have to figure out what's the underlying cause, okay? So um, common causes of irritable bowel syndrome. So let's kind of take this kind of one by one, okay? Um, and I'll kind of just kind of introduce these topics and then we'll go uh, a little bit more in depth with the slides. Um, so the first things that it can cause or common causes of irritable bowel is what's called leaky gut, okay? You can also have IBS from your poor diet, just the, uh, the diet that you are consuming on a daily basis. Now, the most common foods that will cause uh, inflammation in your gut are five food groups. There's gluten, there's dairy, there's corn, there's soy, and there's eggs. Okay, so remember those. Gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and eggs. Those are your top five most inflammatory foods, okay? So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the detail, uh, but you can also have what's called bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. Um, again, you can have some type of yeast infection or yeast overgrowth. You can have some type of parasitic infection. All of these can cause some type of irritable bowel syndrome, okay? So let's talk about leaky gut. And leaky gut is really the gateway to autoimmunity and chronic inflammatory diseases. And the reason being is, you know, your gut, the environment that's in your gut compared to what's in your bloodstream, because everything in your bloodstream is sterile, okay? But in your gut, you've got bacteria, you've got undigested food, you've got pathogens, you've got viruses, uh, you may have some fungal or parasitic issues in, in the gut, but that's really is contained in the gut by a layer of cells or epithelial cells, and that's really all it is. It's just one layer of cells, okay? These are your villi, your microvilli, and they have what's called tight junctions or gap junctions, okay? So I know that those are kind of big terms. So the analogy that I like to use when explaining to patients is imagine um, a, a house that's made out of bricks or a building that's made out of bricks, okay? Now imagine, if you will, that these bricks have shrunk due to inflammation 
And so if the bricks shrink, then you have spaces where uh, in between the bricks and the grout where critters can come in, where bugs can come in and you know, start invading this area. You don't want that, okay? But that's basically what's going on with the leaky gut. Your tight junctions are no longer you know, holding up that environment and it's allowing the leakage or the passage of bacteria and viruses and partially undigested food into the bloodstream, okay? Now imagine this scenario. You've got partially undigested food in the bloodstream and now you activate your immune cells, uh, uh, cells. Your T cells, your B cells, your natural killer cells are now activated because you've got these foreign objects that are floating around in your bloodstream that shouldn't be there, okay? But because they've leaked from your gut into the bloodstream, they're now there and it's causing constant immune activation, okay? Now let's take, for example, gluten and you have let's say you have a gluten sensitivity and you have a gluten reaction and so you're consuming gluten multiple times a day multiple times a week extrapolate that over months and over years and you have this chronic inflammatory issue that's going on okay your your immune cells are constantly attacking these what's called amino acid sequences in these partially undigested food but over time, your immune cells can get confused about what's actually in the floating around in your bloodstream versus what's actually like in your, the, the same amino acid sequences that are in your own tissues. So let's say, for example, you have the same amino acid sequence from these partially undigested foods that's constantly being attacked. Well, if these same amino acid sequences are in your thyroid, then your immune system starts to attack that as well. Okay? And that's how you get Hashimoto's. If it's in the same amino acid sequence that's in the cartilage, specifically in your wrist, then you start to develop rheumatoid arthritis, okay? If it's anything in your gut, it can be Crohn's disease, it could be ulcerative colitis, it could be celiac disease, okay? So these are some of the things that, uh, that can happen, and this is why I you know, say that it's the gateway to inflammation, it's the gateway to autoimmune diseases. So if you've got a leaky gut, you've really got to uh, treat it and take care of it. Uh, there are some blood tests to test for leaky guts, uh, but typically, you know, if you've already got an autoimmune disease, more than likely you've got a leaky gut, okay? So let's move on from that. I don't want to spend too much time there with that. I will probably do another webinar um, on leaky gut alone, or maybe combine the leaky gut and the microbiome um, webinar uh, together in a future, um, uh, maybe next month, okay? Now, SIBO, this is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, okay? And what SIBO is, is basically your small intestine, so let's go back to the anatomy here, okay? Your small intestine and your large intestine are separated by a valve, or think of it as a door. It's a one-way valve. It's a one-way door, okay? So as food is traveling down into the small intestines, it goes through this door, which is called the ileocecal valve, and then it's a one-way valve. Food doesn't come back up, okay? What's in there, it's committed, and then it goes back out and travels into your uh, large intestine and eventually out, um, uh, into, you poop it out, okay? However, when you have distension, when you have gas, when you have bloating, you expand the tube uh, where the, the, the ileocecal valve is, and so as a result, that valve remains open, okay? Now, typically, all of your bacteria are housed in the large intestine and there's very little that's in the small intestines okay but when that valve stays open all of this bacteria can then migrate relocate into the small intestines and repopulate that area and so they're in an area where they shouldn't be and as a result it's going to cause a constant low-grade immune reaction and it's going to cause a constant low-grade inflammatory issue but it will also cause even more bloating and distension because anytime you eat some type of refined carbohydrates or some type of sweets or you know 
grains or what have you, anything that these bacteria can feed on, uh, they're going to produce gas. And that gas will expand your uh, small intestines and it will actually look like you're three to four months pregnant. So that's the most common complaints that my patients give me is that they, they feel or they look like they're three to four months pregnant because of this bloating and this gas that they're having. So this is actually one of the ways to test for this is a breath test, okay? Um, so these bacteria do produce gas and it, 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 if you, you, know, you measure certain levels of gases uh, with this breath test and that's how you can confirm that you've got SIBO. And if you've got SIBO, then you've got to treat this. And there's two ways to treat this. You can either treat it uh, with antibiotics, which is, I try to use that as a last course, um, or, you know, um, well, I, I try to use it maybe fixing it with a diet first and maybe through supplementation. And if that doesn't work, then go ahead and use antibiotics. But uh, the advantage of, you know, uh, fixing this with diet and supplement first is that not only do you fix SIBO, but you also help with yeast infections, okay? Because again, yeast infections can um, uh, do similar reactions. It can cause the bloating. It can cause the excess gas. It can cause the IBS, okay? Um, but, you know, minimizing your car refined carbohydrates in your diet, minimizing sugar, because that, that's what yeast feed on. They feed on the sugar in your diet, okay? So when you minimize that, you really decrease um, uh, or you allow your immune system to handle the amount of yeast in there and uh, you prevent it from um, overgrowing, okay? Now, parasitic infections, okay? This is a this is always a um, a creepy subject for me uh, because contrary to popular belief, you do not need to live in a third world country to have any type of parasitic infection. Okay, in fact, um, I have a patient who's a retired cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, he was complaining of abdominal issues and some brain fog. And so we ran a stool test with him and we found five different worms living in his gut. It was a shock to me. It was a shock to him. He had no idea how he got it. He's never been to a third world country. Um, didn't, doesn't know how long he's had it, but nevertheless, he did. Uh, fortunately, he did respond well to natural uh, botanicals that uh, are anti-parasitics. We didn't have to use any types of medications with him. Um, but uh, he said when his body finally released them, it was like a nightmare. And uh, you can just imagine how I get squeamish just kind of thinking about it. But that's what can happen. Okay. But if you do have parasites, that's something that can create symptoms related to IBS, okay? And again, it's a chronic source of inflammation, all right? So if you've got them, get rid of them. <laughs> you don't want them. The key is, though, you have to treat the entire family, okay? Because even though you treat yourself and you get rid of your parasites, if those parasites are in your spouse, you can get re-inoculated. If they're you know, from your pets, you can get re-inoculated. Uh, or your children, same thing. So you've got to really treat the entire household to errat make sure that you've eradicated these parasites completely, okay? And also, you've got to do multiple tests. And I, rem I recommend doing multiple stool samples every eight to 12 weeks because parasites, they have a dormant phase. And so they can lie dormant, and again, you can get a false negative test on the stool test, uh, but the more that you do them, you know, the more accurate that you're going to get, okay? All right, so food intolerances, allergies, and sensitivities. This is probably the most common reason for IBS, okay? The standard American diet is a SAD diet, get it? S-A-D. It's a SAD diet, okay? 
and really the grains, the you know, uh, GMOs, the genetic modifications that uh, they put in our food, the glyphosate, uh, the chemicals in our foods, these are very pro-inflammatory to the gut. And it causes inflammation, which can lead to, again, leaky gut, which causes all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, havoc on the immune system and may even lead to autoimmune diseases, as I stated earlier. But um, it's really kind of, well, it's not so common sense, so to speak, but you really got to watch what you, you know, put in your food or in your diet, okay? Again, the five major inflammatory ones are gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and eggs. Okay, let me tell you a brief story. I've got a buddy of mine who's an EMT, and I was playing golf with him uh, about a week ago, and I asked him, you know, what's the, what do you think you waste your time on when you go out to a call? Okay, what's the most common waste of time or calls that you get? And he goes, well, it's got to be stomach issues. Okay, I get calls all the time. He said last, uh, maybe about a month ago, he got a call, went to a house, patient was basically on the floor with severe stomach cramping and it turned out that uh, he gets these stomach cramps every other day and he looks around the house and he sees 12 bags of jack-in-the-box everywhere and he's like you know maybe if you didn't eat so much jack-in-the-box you wouldn't have these stomach issues okay but he says he sees these a lot this is very common you know most people don't understand what they're eating is actually, you know, uh, not good for them. It, 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 it's, it's, it's not even food. Okay. You want to go back to eating natural and whole foods. Okay. Cause that's something that's going to heal your gut. Eat organic if possible. Eat uh, wild caught, you know, steroid free, antibiotic free meats. Um, that's your best bet right there. Okay. Now, I talked about food allergy testing in the past or a couple slides ago. And so what you really want to keep in mind is you want to test for what's called IgG and also IgA antibodies. I know IgA is not listed on here, but you want to make sure that you're testing for both IgG and IgA. Because if you're chronically sick, your immune system can be so depressed that it doesn't even produce IgG antibodies, okay? But what happens is when your IgG levels go down, your IgA levels usually go up. So when you're testing for both IgG and IgA, you're going to get a more accurate test. Okay. Now, there are some tests out there that also test for IgM and IgE. Let me backtrack a little bit. Ig just stands for immunoglobulins. Okay. So there's different types. There's A, G, M, and E. Okay. Those are the big ones that we know of. The IgMs and IgEs, those are a little bit more of a short-term type of a reaction, maybe lasting no more than three to four days each, okay? So it's not going to give you an accurate test if you consume, let's say, dairy a week ago and you hadn't had dairy. And well, if you do an IgM or uh, test for, for dairy, you may get some false negative. So the longer ones are the IgG and IgA, and you want to make sure that you test for both, okay? Okay. So this is a test that I run with my patients. This is from Cyrex Labs. And this is an immune uh, or a gluten cross-reaction panel. These are foods that can behave like gluten in your body. So sometimes it's not enough to be just gluten-free, okay? Sometimes you have to also look at the foods that can cross-react and behave like gluten in your body because this is something that you need to avoid, okay? So... These are the tests that for, we're testing for all of these different food groups here on the left. And then in, if it's in range or if it's normal, meaning they're non-reactive, it's gonna be in the green. Anything in the yellow, and this third column should be red, it didn't come out though, but uh, anything in the yellow and in the red category, these are things that patients need to avoid because these are things that they're sensitive to and are causing constant immune activations in the bodies, okay? so. Uh, again, this is a test for both IgG and IgA, and um, it's, I love it because it, you know, it, it gives you a black and white marker of, or black and white uh, you know, answers as far as what food groups that patients need to avoid. The 
cons for this test is it is pretty expensive. It's just, it's 300, I think, believe it's about $350 if I'm not mistaken, just for this test, okay? The alternative to this is to do what's called an elimination provocation diet. And that's actually part of the treatment to kind of help with IBS and leaky gut and candida issues and SIBO issues um, is, is part of that elimination provocation diet. So let me backtrack a little bit. So in order to treat everything, you, we go through what's called the 4R program, okay? Some people may say 5Rs, but we'll go with 4, okay? 4, <laughs> I said. All right. With four, so the four R's is remove, repair, restore, and replace. The fifth R can be repopulate with, you know, different probiotics, but, um, you know, let's just stick with the four R's, okay? So in the remove phase, you basically want to do an elimination diet, okay? You want to remove everything that's going to be pro-inflammatory to you, okay? So again, this is the fourth time I think I'm saying this, the gluten, the dairy, the corn, soy, and the eggs, remove that for 30 days, okay? If you have a chronic autoimmune issue or a chronic fatigue issue, you may have to do more than those five food groups. You may have to do what's called an autoimmune paleo diet, which is a little bit more restrictive. Um, I do have a guide that tells you what you can eat and what you can't eat, so if that's something that you need, send me an email and I'll email you that guide. Again, my email address is info at sdbraincenter.com. Okay, but going back, so if, if you don't have any of these chronic inflammatory issues and you just wanna kind of get back to your health and reset, those five food groups, again, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and eggs. Okay, remove that for a month. And then start introducing it back into your diet every three days. So you only wanna introduce one food group every three days okay it's important to keep notes it's important to keep a journal because you want to basically find out if you have a reaction to a particular food so let's say you have a reaction let's say after 30 days you try dairy and you only do dairy for the first three days okay you don't introduce anything else okay that's the only variable you want to you know adjust and then you just annotate, do you have any brain fog? Do you have any fatigue? Do you have any mood swings? Do you have any muscle aches or you know, joint pain? Do you have any bloating? Do you have any distension? Any changes with your bowel movements? These are some of the things that you want to look for, okay? And then if you don't, then you just move on to the next food group. And then you can kind of tell, your body can uh, you know, uh, tell you what you're sensitive to and what you're allergic to, okay? All right. So the roles of probiotics and prebiotics, this is the, again, the restore phase, okay? So probiotics are the good bacteria that are in our gut, okay? And probiotics serve a host of functions. They, they you know, they um, synthesize vitamins, uh, they synthesize enzymes, uh, cofactors, um, short chain fatty acids, that's a big one, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and they also, again, make, you know, neurotransmitters and, um, uh, you know, that eventually affect our mood. But when it comes to probiotics, you know, obviously you want to get them naturally through your foods if you can. Uh, you can get them through sauerkraut, uh, kombucha, um, kefir, um, kimchi, was, that's a big one. Uh, but anything that's kind of fermented, even yogurt, if you don't have any types of dairy sensitivities, you can get them through, through yogurt. But those are good methods of getting probiotics. But you also want to get them through supplementation, okay? Um, and what the biggest thing now in terms of probiotics is what's called spore biotics. So I like to introduce spore biotics for like the first two months, and then I like to rotate um, you know, different types of probiotics after that. So I don't like sticking with one probiotic. Um, I like to rotate them because the research is telling us that the more abundance and the more variability that you have in the bacteria, the better off and, uh, you'll be, the more healthier you, you will be, okay? If you're eating, so if, you, if you've got a very plain diet and you're eating the same thing over and over and over again, you're not creating abundance, you're not creating variety in, those, in these probiotics, 
and that leads to poor health, okay? Now, going back to prebiotics. Prebiotics are basically what feeds probiotics, okay? So the prebiotics are typically things that you would find in fiber. Now, you'd get them from things like inulin, uh, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, garlic, onions, uh, ginger. Those are all kind of good sources of prebiotics. And again, these feed your probiotics, okay? Now, this is something that's kind of really exciting to me, and it's, it's the gut microbiome, okay? When you're feeding your good your bacteria, your good bacteria really, um, uh, they then synthesize what's called short-chain fatty acids, okay? And these short-chain fatty acids are things like uh, butyrate or acetate or propionate. Those, you don't need to know those, but just know that they produce short-chain fatty acids from the fiber that you bring into your diet, okay? Now, these short-chain fatty acids actually have a direct effect on the immune system, meaning they calm down the immune system, okay? Um, they also upregulate the you know, uh, functions of these protective bacteria, which then leads to neurotransmitters, which then leads to you know, uh, 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 more serotonin, more dopamine, which you know, basically leads to an active lifestyle, which leads to health, okay? So it really depends on what's going on with your gut and what you're feeding your gut bacteria that is basically uh, how health is expressed or how you, you start uh, uh, to regain your health, okay? Now, new studies have also shown that these bacteria can affect our metabolism. So it has an effect on weight gain. It has an effect on bowel movements and nutrition delivery, okay? So it's an exciting uh, uh, field right now. Um, you know, people are actually doing fecal transplants, uh, which I know it sounds gross, but it's, uh, I can talk about that later on, again, in another webinar. But it really is, it, it depends on your microbiome, okay? We have, our genes have been mapped out, and we only have roughly about 20 to 23,000 genes, okay? The genes that our microbiome consist of can be up to about 10 to 20 million, okay? And so that has a much more of an effect on our lifestyle and on how our health uh, in terms of what we're eating. And, and again, the more diverse uh, your diet is in terms of uh, you know, plant-based diet, the more fibers that you take in, more fruits and vegetables that you take in, and you want to, you know, be exotic with them, try different things all the time. Uh, if you, you don't like them, put them in a Vitamix and blend them all up and then just drink it. And that way you don't have to drink, you know, uh, kind of chew it and taste it. But uh, those are great ways to get these new fibers into you. And, and that's a great way to feed your microbiome and to feed these good bacteria. Okay, all right. I know I went a little crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I do get excited talking about that because I've used actually short chain fatty acids with some patients, and um, you know we started uh, supplement supplementing them with short chain fatty acids, and they've you know people have an increase in energy. They've got an increase in mental alertness. They've got an increase in weight loss. Um, you know, they're just burning fat. Uh, it's just kind of melting out their body without really doing anything else extra. Okay. It's really amazing. Okay. I got to stop. Let's move on. Um, digestive enzymes. Okay. So digestive enzymes. Um, the thing with digestive enzymes is you have to dose them up to an appropriate level that's based on you. Okay. So everyone there's no set dose or there's no specific dose for digestive enzymes, okay? Because everyone has different needs. Um, you have to ha take what's called the maximum effective dose, okay? So in terms of, let's say, HCL, if you take HCL, you have to take enough HCL to actually get a burning sensation or acidic sensation in your gut. And once you get that, then you take one less, okay? And that's when you know that you're taking enough to digest your foods, okay? 
Now, you may also need pancreatic enzymes, and these are your lipase, your protease, and your amylase enzymes. These are things that break down fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, this is, again, coming from your pancreas, but sometimes you can have obstructions in your bile duct or your pancreatic ducts, uh, and it just doesn't get to where it needs to be. And so sometimes you just may need to supplement uh, with these enzymes. But uh, again, you've got to kind of time that specifically. You have to take these digestive enzymes before meals, not during meals. Uh, and again, if you take enough um, HCL, that actually helps to activate these digestive enzymes as well, okay? Now, further supplementation that may be needed, um, and these, again, when you're chronically inflamed, you're constantly using up your antioxidants. And these antioxidants are things like glutathione, alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, um, and, and turmeric and resveratrol. These are things that can help you replace that uh, and really protect your mitochondria. Because when you're chronically inflamed, your mitochondria is one of the first things that's attacked. The mitochondria, let's go, let's go back. In your cells, every cell in your body, well, not every cell, most cells in your body have a mitochondria, and that mitochondria is what produces ATP. It's our most basic form of energy, okay? But when you have inflammation, you have what's called free radicals that attack the cells and attack the mitochondria, which then, um, minimizes inflammation in your body. I actually did a video um, a few months ago on inflammation and free radicals. So if you want to get a little bit more understanding of that, just search for that. It's, uh, it's me doing a whiteboard video on inflammation and glutathione. Okay? But these may be some things that you need to replace. You may need also replace some short chain fatty acids uh, or even, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, because these things help protect your cells again as well. But that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Not everybody needs that. You really have to work with uh, either your functional medicine doctor or someone who knows what they're doing uh, to really assess your supplementation needs. Last but not least, okay, in order to heal your gut, in order to minimize inflammation, you have to minimize stress, okay? Because stress, and a pro again, this is, again, another webinar that I'll have to do on the adrenals because the adrenals are your main stress organs. They are glands that sit right on top of each kidneys, and they produce, well, they produce all kinds of hormones, but the main one is cortisol. And our bodies were not designed to be in a certain, you know, in a stressful environment 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 30 days out of the month, okay? We need to relax. You need to basically go back to enjoying what it is that you enjoy, whether it's playing a musical instrument, whether it's dancing, whether it's playing a sport, whether it's painting or drawing or singing, whatever it is that relaxes you and gets back to being you, do it, okay? Because that's something that is very restorative and reparative to uh, your immune system okay your immune system is actually it, it doesn't work that well when you're in a fight or flight mode okay well, that's a sympathetic nervous system we need to get you in a parasympathetic nervous system where your body is more in a relaxed state um, where your body can heal okay um I'm going to have to do my, uh, that again, that's its own webinar in itself, because it, we will have to talk about uh, um, adrenals and how that relates to blood sugar and insulin, but uh, look for that down the road. Okay, resource alert. So a lot of people want to know where I get my information from or where I get my references from. Um, I use PubMed.com. Uh, PubMed is the biggest collection of medical resources, your medical libraries. It's got all kinds of information in there. It's kind of like a Google. You just search for what type, whatever nutrient or whatever disease that you have, um, and you, you'll have all kinds of scientific literature that's there. Okay. As far as this webinar is concerned, I've got roughly about mm, 15, uh, 20 different reference uh, articles. And if you want those, I can definitely forward them 
to you, just email me. Okay. Um, I want to end with this tale of two wolves. Okay. And I read this from Facebook roughly about mm, maybe three or four years ago, but it really resonated with me. Okay. And here it goes. An old Cherokee told his grandson, my son, there is a battle between two wolves inside us all. One is evil, it is anger, it is jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, and ego, okay? The other is good, it is joy, it is peace, it is love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. So the boy thought, thought about it and he asked grandfather which one wins or which wolf will win and the old man quickly replied it's the one that you feed okay and so i think you can relate to this what if, if you've got anything from this um little webinar we've got bacteria that's in our gut we've got good and bad bacteria if you feed the good bacteria uh primarily with you know uh different types of fiber, different types of vegetables, different types of fruits, um, natural foods, uh, then you'll express energy, you'll express good, you'll express joy and peace, okay, because you'll build up these neurotransmitters that have an effect on your brain. However, if you feed the bad bacteria with refined carbohydrates, simple sugars, junk food, all kinds of chemicals, then you're going to express poor health, you're going to express low energy, you're going to express fatigue, you're going to express anxiety and depression, and eventually it'll, you'll express disease, okay? So I like this little story. It kind of wraps everything kind of, uh, you know, hopefully in a, um, a little story that you, hopefully that you can remember, but um, there you go. It all depends on your diet. So I want to thank you again um, for taking the time to listen. For those that weren't able to join me, again, I apologize. I don't know what happened, but this is recorded, and I will send out the link to this recording as soon as it is done, okay? Um, again, my goal and my passion is to educate my patients and the public about what I know um, you know, and what I've gathered over 15 years of doing functional medicine and, 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 and functional neurology. And hopefully you can get back to being healthy again and you can regain your quality of life because life really is meant to be fun. It's meant to be lived, enjoy the outdoors, go on a hike, go on a walk, enjoy time with your loved ones, laugh, be happy. Um, <laughs> the you know the opposite is just not worth it it's it's either get busy dying or get busy living and i'd rather get busy living so thank you guys again um and hopefully we'll see you next time we'll, next month again i'll probably do the webinar on leaky gut and that human microbiome all right take care and we'll see you guys next month bye bye